What's up guys? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another audiobook. Today we're doing the second book in the, sorry, second book? Second story in the puppet carver called Jump for Tickets. And I've heard a lot about this one uh, being a, pr a pretty good one, a pretty good one I'd, I'd say. Um, I, I really can't wait to, to read this one because just the title alone, Jump for Tickets, sounds horrifying to me because I know it's going to be one of those creepy like arcade games or something and it's going to punish you for being wrong or something. I don't know. I just want to get straight into it with my reaction. Remember, uh, if you do enjoy this audiobook, then make sure that you press that subscribe button because we're really close to 10,000. And anyway, let's get straight into it. The little kid's grating voice blared through Colton's headphones as high-pitched and as annoying as a spo smoke alarm. Did you just kill me? That was harsh, dude. It was a mercy-killing squeaker, <laughs> Colton said, emphasising the new deepness of his voice. He was going for a tough and sarcastic tone, like an action hero. Too bad you can respawn. Colton hated the little kids who tried to play Hammer of Odin. Ooh! Hammer of Odin! I see some Norse, Norse mythology here. Uh, his favourite online role-playing game. The little brats dominated the chat function, trying and failing to make the more mature players think they were cool. Hammer of Odin wasn't appropriate for little kids anyway. It was rated T, so it was for teens like Colton. The little pipsqueaks should stick to playing block builder <laughs> like Colton had played last year when he was still in middle school. That's definitely a rip-off of Minecraft. When Colton looked back at middle school, he didn't even recognise the person he had been. For one thing, his dad was still alive. Colton had been a happy, carefree, regular kid, not worried about anything more serious than how long it would take him to save up his generous allowance for a new video game. But on an icy road just over a year ago, the accident happened and everything had changed. Life had changed. Colton had changed. Colton couldn't get over the unfairness of the uh, incident. His dad had been relatively young and took good care of himself, but none of that mattered because of a stupid patch of ice and a strip of road without a guardrail. When it first happened, Colton had kept all his sadness inside. He hadn't cried, not even at the funeral. But over time, his sadness had hardened into anger. How could a person not be angry living in a world where good people died for no reason? Colton knew that his mum and some of his teachers were worried about how cold and bitter he seemed. What was he supposed to do? A happy dance? His dad was dead, and he lived in a world where people rarely got what they deserved. If he lashed out sometimes, so what? He was suffering, and if other people ended up getting a taste of that pain, then at least he didn't suffer alone. Colton jumped in surprise when a hand touched his shoulder. He looked up to see his mom, dressed in her light blue scrubs. Her curly brown hair was pulled back in a tight bun, like she always wore it when she was going to work. She gestured at him to remove his headset. He sighed in exasperation, but reluctantly complied. What? His mum shook her head at him, though she was smiling. I'm going to work, is what? I'm pulling an 8 to 8 shift tonight. Heaven help me. There's a t Here's a $10 bill if you want to go out and get a soda and play some games. That way, at least one of us will be having fun. Okay, thanks, Mom. The $10 bill was a once-a-week treat. Once a month, right after payday, she would give him a 20. You've got your key, right? She put on the lanyard she kept next to the door. Colton resisted the urge to roll his eyes. Yes, Mom. Remember to lock the door if you go out, she said, grabbing her keys and purse. And call the third floor nurse's station if you need anything. One of the other nurses can come find me. I will, Colton said, putting his headset back on to block out the barrage of nagging. After he got to a good stopping place in Hammer of Odin, he probably would head over to Freddy Fazbear's. The pizza place was le less than a ten minute walk from the apartment building. He knew he was really too old for Freddy's and he had no interest in the creepy animatronics or the bland pizza. But some of the games were still fun, and there was the lure of tickets that, would, that could be redeemed for prizes. It took a ridiculous number of tickets to win anything good, of course. Most kids, especially the stupid little ones, 
cashed in their tickets at the end of their visit and walked away with garbage like tiny plastic dinosaurs or a handful of cheap candy. But Colton wasn't short-sighted like those babies. He'd been saving up his tickets for a long time, months, so he could cash them in for something really good. For the astronomical price of 10,000 tickets, there was a new handheld game console he had his eye on, which was two models more up to date than the one he was currently playing. That was the thing about living with his mom. She worked hard at her job as a licensed practical nurse at the hospital, but one income didn't go far. With his dad gone, Colton and his mum had learned to settle for less, living in a small apartment instead of a house, buying store brand groceries instead of the brand name stuff, playing older games on older equipment while Colton's friends seemed to buy new games and consoles as, ca as, um, sorry, as casually as if they were bottles of soda. He wasn't a poor kid, exactly. They had a roof over their heads and clothes to wear and plenty to eat, but there was no money for what his mum always called luxuries. New name brand clothes and sneakers were luxuries. So were new games and nearly everything else that had the word new in front of it. Colton understood that his mum couldn't make money magically appear. But maybe if he spent enough time at Freddy's, he could make tickets magically appear. If he got good at the highest ticket yielding games, he could win that games console. 10,000 tickets. He was going to do it. When he had told his mum the plan, she laughed and said, Remind me never to take you to Las Vegas when you're old enough to gamble. But winning the tickets at Freddy's wasn't about Las Vegas style luck. It was about skill, using your abilities to make the system work in your favour. Colton knew he had the skills. Colton si signed out of Hammer of Odin, went to the kitchen, and made himself a ham and cheese sandwich with pickles and mayo, which he gobbled, standing over the sink. He had already eaten dinner, but he was always hungry these days. It's like you have a hollow leg, his mom always said. He grabbed his jacket and shoved the $10 bill in his pocket. Time to win some tickets. It always took a few minutes to adjust to how overstimulating the environment at Freddy's was. Multicoloured lights flashed, arcade games bleeped and blipped, and a band of creepy animatronics, uh, animatronic animals led by top-hatted Freddy Fazbear sang uh, canned versions of kiddie tunes. And then there were the kiddies themselves, laughing, screaming, throwing tantrums and running around underfoot like cockroaches. It was all Colton could do not to squash them. Colton took a quick trip by the prize counter to make sure his dream console was still there. It was. There was still hope. He backtracked to the counter where tokens were sold. He laid down his 10 and told the cashier, $10 in tokens please. He wasn't going to waste any of his limited funds on a soda. No reason for spending a buck 99 that wouldn't move him any closer to his goal. If he got thirsty, he could drink, drink from the water fountain. He went to play his regulars, DD's fishing hole and BB's ball drop, each of which yielded him a fairly long ribbon of tickets. Oh, I love that. DD's fishing hole and BB's ball drop. Um, oh god, don't look into BB's ball drop too much. <laughs> oh no. Oh, and DD's fishing hole. Oh boy, these are euphemisms. Um, the evening was off to a promising start. Near the stage, a table full of rugrats, kindergartners, uh, from the looks of them, were munching pizza and wearing stupid-looking paper birthday hats decorated with cartoon characters. Their chubby, blank faces were smeared with pepperoni grease and tomato sauce. As he looked at them, Colton felt actual physical repulsion, as though he was surveying a nest of squirming maggots. And then Colton saw him. One of the horrible pizza-gobbling goblins was his little cousin, Aiden. Aiden was the most annoying little brat of all time, and because he was Colton's aunt uh, Katie's kid, the two of them were forced to spend time in each other's presence on holidays, birthdays, and whenever else his mum and aunt wanted to get together. The worst thing about Aiden was that he loved Colton desperately, and no matter how much venom Colton spewed at him, Aiden only seemed to love him more. Please don't let him see me, please don't let him see me. Colton muttered under his breath. But it was too late. Aiden's gaze was already focused on Colton, 
and he was smiling and waving uh, frantically. The little boy dropped his pizza slice, got up from the table and made a beeline for Colton. Before Colton could protest, uh, Aidan was hugging him. Colton stood stiffly, his arms raised as though a police officer had just told him to freeze. He refused to participate in his hug. Aidan finally let go, his smile hadn't faded. Wow, I can't believe I get to go to a birthday party at Freddy's and I get to see my cousin at the same time. This is the best night ever. For one of us, maybe, Colton said. Aiden laughed. <laughs> You're funny, Colton. I'd better get back to the party. It's almost time for our favourite game. You know the one, right? Aiden gave him a little chuck on the arm. Colton did know what game Aiden was talking about, but refused to acknowledge it. He rubbed his arm as if Aiden had injured him. Thankfully, Aiden ran back to join his putrid, pint-sized friends. Now who's ready to jump for tickets? A recorded voice asked as the animatronic Freddy flapped his jaws. The greasy little brats jumped up and down and cheered. Their high-pitched voices made Colton want to clap his hands over his ears. Get ready for the ticket pulverizer countdown, the recorded Freddy voice ordered. A bored-looking college-aged girl in a Freddy's uniform opened the door to the ticket pulverizer, a game in a sealed, transparent booth that would generate a, an absurd number of tickets. The ticket pulverizer usually cost four tokens per person, but for birthday parties, the birthday kid and guests got one visit to the pulverizer for free. Colton watched as the disinterested-seeming employee unlocked the booth, and the pipsqueaks poured in giggling and yelling with excitement. Now get ready to jump for tickets, the recorded Freddy voice ordered, and say hello to our, our friend, Coils the Birthday Clown. Colton didn't like clowns, and he especially didn't like this clown. Coils the Birthday Clown animatronic had wonky eyes, one that seemed to look straight ahead while the other veered down and to the right and a weird open-jawed grin that reminded Colton of those carnival games where you shoot water in the clown's mouth. Is this uh, the lemonade clown? <laughs> and, the, uh, and the other one, the, the fruit juice one? No, it's not fruit juice, it's something else. I don't remember. Um, its lanky body was... Oh, lanky. Oh, okay. Its lanky body was dressed in a lemon and lime coloured striped costume that was decorated with little jingly bells, which Colton guessed was so you could hear the clown before you saw it. It reminded him of the old story about the mice who went, who want to hang a bell on a cat to use as an early warning system. The clown's name came from its arms, which were yellow stretchy coils that reminded Colton of the old-fashioned landline phone at his grandmother's house. In one of the clown's three-fingered, white-gloved hands, it held several fanned-out tickets. Now who's ready to jump for tickets? The clown's high-pitched voice said again, turning up the drama. The squeakers went insane. I love how they refer to them as squeakers. Prepare for the ticket pulverizer countdown. Now, when I finish counting, everybody jump up and down as hard as you can, all together. Here we go. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The clown's voice actor had really been trying to turn up the excitement when he recorded this. Now, jump for tickets! <laughs> Laughing and squealing, the little kids leaped up and then landed in unison as the parents watching them called. Jump! 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 With each landing, they pushed down the platform on the floor of the booth, which caused tickets to fall from the ceiling. Oh, that's so cool. Delighted, they grabbed the tickets in their greedy little fists. Colton watched the spectacle with a mixture of jealousy and disgust. All those tickets, and the little brats were wasting them. You only got to keep what you caught, and the little kids were being stupid about it grabbing over and over with their hands, dropping the tickets they had just caught in order to catch the new ones. They weren't smart enough to stuff the tickets into their pockets, down their shirts, inside their socks. If it were Colton, he would stick tickets everywhere they'd fit, in his underwear, in his mouth. But even though the little kids annoyed him, 
They weren't what really filled him with rage. The true object of his wrath was the ticket pulverizer itself. It was rigged to give an unfair advantage to little kids. He knew it. He had watched it dozens of times, maybe even a hundred, and the results were always the same. Whenever there were little kids inside it, jumping and stomping, there was always a, a veritable blizzard of tickets. If Colton and other teens jumped for tickets, there were only a few flurries. It made no sense. Colton was no physicist, but he knew that heavier, stronger kids generated more force than shrimpy, weak ones. More force should equal more tickets. It was as simple as that. True, true. Diving deep into the science of the, of the game. As Colton watched the pipsqueak party guests exit the ticket pulverizer, an idea began to form in his mind. If the ticket pulverizer had been rigged to favour little kids, could it be re-rigged to favour big ones? Colton excelled at his tech classes in high school, and he liked to hang around his Uncle Mike's car repair shop to learn how to fix things. He was good at mechanical stuff. <sighs> Mike. For God's sake, <laughs> for goodness sake, why, <laughs> why, why are there so many mics? Now that the kids had cleared out of the ticket pulverizer, Colton approached it for a closer look. Getting inside the machine wouldn't be hard. If it was turned on, he would just have to feed it four tokens. He surveyed the boot's bright red platform, which was printed with pictures of child-sized footprints. He looked at the screws that connected the platform to the bottom of the booth. Wouldn't tightening those screws make the platform harder to push down? He needed to give it some more thought, but he was confident that he could re-rig the pulverizer so it favoured bigger visitors instead of small ones. Justice would be served, and after only a dozen or so rounds of jump for tickets, Colton would be able to claim his new game console. He's doing all this for a game console. Hey, Carlton, Aiden's annoying, high-pitched voice interrupted Colton's thoughts. Colton looked down to see the freckle-faced freak holding so many long ribbons of tickets he could hardly grasp them in his tiny fists. Hey, Colton, look how many tickets I got, Aiden said. I see, Colton hissed. Now, shoo, do you want any half of my, do you want half of my tickets? Aiden asked. Holding out a fistful. I don't want your stupid tickets. I want you to go away. Colton was filled with a white hot rage. Why did this loathsome little creature have to pester him all the time? Okay. Bye, Colton. Aiden ran off to join his repulsive little friends. With Aiden gone, Colton returned to his plan. It was a beautiful plan, except for one thing. Colton suddenly realised that he couldn't dismantle the ticket pulverizer when Freddy's was open and full of employees, screaming kids and exhausted parents. If a worker caught him messing with the machine, the manager would be called, and Colton would be thrown out and maybe even banned from returning. If the manager was in a really bad mood, she might even call the police. Getting in that sort of trouble was a risk he couldn't take, no. If Colton was going to fix the ticket pulverizer, he was going to have to do it when the place was empty. Yeah, okay. I see where this is going. <laughs> Colton realised that to get what he wanted, he had only one choice. Late one night, while his mum was at work, he was going to have to break into Freddy Fazbear's. Uncle Mike slid out from under the car he was working on. Hey, kiddo, he said, smiling up at his nephew. Ready to do some apprentice work for me today? Sure, Colton said. He liked Uncle Mike's repair shop. It smelt of... Its smell of grease and rubber, the tools lying around, the endless parade of cars to work on. He liked his bearded, paunchy uncle too. If Colton continued to do well in his technical classes at school and apprenticed for Uncle Mike a couple of afternoons a week, Mike had promised Colton that he could have a job in the shop as soon as he graduated high school. Mike wiped his eyes on a grease-stained rag and nodded in the direction of a blue SUV. Rear passenger tyre on that one needs changing. I already got out the new tyre and the tolls you need. You know what you're doing, right? Sure. Colton liked that Uncle Mike gave him credit for knowing some things. Colton had changed a lot of tyres, mostly in Mike's shop, but once on the side of the interstate, when his mom's car had a blowout. 
big summer blowout. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, his mom had made a big deal out of that, telling everybody she knew how he saved the day. Colton worked efficiently at changing the tyre. He felt most satisfied when he was working with his, fr with his hands. Writing papers for school made him stressed out and frustrated, both when he had to write the paper and when he got the graded paper back with a C on it, if he was lucky. But he knew he was an A-plus student when it came to fixing things. Looks good, man, Uncle Mike said, surveying Colton's work. Once I put in a new timing belt on this one over here, it needs an oil change. Think you're up for it? Uh, Colton smiled and nodded. He was good at oil changes, too. Uh, you want me to catch the, uh, you want me to, oh wait, yeah, no, you want, sorry, <laughs> you want to watch me change the timing belt, so you'll know how to do it, oh no, wait, no, that is Mike, sorry, I have to do it in the voice, <clears throat> you want me to change the, <laughs> you want to watch me change the timing belt, so you'll know how to do it, sure, Colton followed his uncle to the car, once he had watched and learned, he got up his courage to ask Mike the question he had been waiting to ask him since he came to the shop. Hey, uh, Uncle Mike, I was wondering, could I borrow a few tools to use over the weekend? I've got a project I'm working on at home. Mike grinned. You know me and tools, kid. I've got uh, extras of everything. Yeah, when it comes to tools, I'm like some women are with shoes. I can't get enough with them. <laughs> Colton grinned back. Yeah, but you don't ask to borrow somebody else's shoes. That'd be weird. Mm, true. Uncle Mike nodded in the direction of a large tool chest sitting against the wall. You're welcome to borrow anything in there. Keep them for longer than the weekend if you need to. I know you'll take good care of them. Thanks, Uncle Mike. Colson felt a little guilty for not being honest about how he was going to use the tools, but not so guilty that he wasn't going to take what he needed. After Colton finished the oil change and drank the soda that Uncle Mike brought him, he opened the chest to survey the tools. What tools would he need to get access to the inner workings of the ticket pulverizer? There might be screws he would need to remove, so he grabbed a couple of different kinds of screwdrivers. A wrench seemed like it might be helpful, and maybe a crossbar in case he needed to pry up the platform on the machine's floor. He needed to keep his tool kit pretty light though, if he was going to be sneaking into the place, he couldn't be slowed down by carrying a lot of heavy equipment. He needed to be swift and stealthy, like a ninja. Colton imagined himself dressed in black, moving smoothly and silently, breaking into Freddy's car under the cover of night, like a character in a movie. A little shiver of excitement ran through him. Tools in hand, Colton left through the front office, where Uncle Mike was settling up with a customer. Thanks for letting me use your stuff, Uncle Mike. No problem, Uncle Mike said. He slipped Colton a $10 bill from the cash register. Colton's apprenticeship wasn't a paid position, but it wasn't rare for Mike to hand him a little bit of cash. This is for doing a good job lending me a hand today, and hey, if you need any help with that project, just let me know. Colton smiled at the thought of asking Uncle Mike to help him break into Freddy Fazbear's to fix the ticket pulverizer. Thanks, but I'd better handle this one on my own. Colton had decided that Saturday night, the next time his mom worked a 8 to 8 shift, would be perfect for the heist, as he had come to call it. But now it was Saturday afternoon and he had just hit a major stumbling block. Colton had gotten the right tools from Uncle Mike and after lots of sketching and planning, he was pretty sure he knew what he needed to re-rig the ticket pulverizer. But there was one obstacle he hadn't thought through. He didn't know how to sneak into the building. Sure, he had pictured himself in a black shirt and black pants and stocking cap, creeping around like a cat on the prowl. He had even pictured himself dodging lasers from the security system like he had seen in a movie once. But he didn't know how to get past the locked doors of Freddy Fazbear's. If he tried to pick the lock, surely an alarm would sound. If he tried to break the glass, an alarm would also sound and he could get busted for vandalism. Colton wanted to get into Freddy's to right a wrong, not to cause trouble, and he certainly didn't want to do anything to land himself in the juvenile detec detention uh, centre. Colton was playing Hammer of Odin and trying to relax so he could think clearly. His character was low on strength and weapons at the moment, but when a potential enemy became visible, Colton moved his character into a cave so he could hide from anger. 
That's when a light switch turned on in Colton's brain. He wouldn't try to break into Freddy's after it closed. He would hang out at Freddy's when it was open, like he did on a lot of Saturday nights. But when it got close to closing time, he wouldn't leave. He would hide. He would stay hidden until the employees had cleaned up the place and shut it down. And then he would come out and repair the ticket pulverizer. Seems logical. By dinner time, Colton was filled with nervous excitement. He sat across from his mum at the table, not making eye contact with her and toying with his food. The fluttering in his stomach seemed to be coming from something much stronger than butterflies. You're not eating much, mum noted, looking at, over at his plate. Spaghetti and meatballs is usually your favourite. I even made extra thinking you'd uh, at least go back for seconds and maybe thirds. Yeah, I know, Colton said, rolling a meatball across his plate with a fork. The spaghetti's great, I just don't have much of an appetite. His mom knitted her brow in concern. Well, that's certainly not like you. You're not coming down with something, are you? There's a nasty stomach bug going around. People have been coming into the ER with it all week. <laughs> COVID. Uh, it's easy to get dehydrated when you can't keep anything down. I don't know, Colton said. I guess I do feel a little tired. Colton wasn't tired at all. But it struck him that being sick might be a useful alibi. He yawned and stretched in what he hoped was a convincing display of fatigue. Hmm, his mum said. Well, if you don't feel any better, maybe you shouldn't go to Freddy's tonight. Being in a closed space with all those germy little kids certainly won't do your immune system or anyone else's any favours. True, Colton said, shuddering a little at the thought of all those little kids' germy paws touching every surface they could reach, spreading disease like rats during the Black Plague. If I don't feel better later, I'll stay home, he said, even though in his mind he was already at Freddy's dismantling the ticket pulverizer. Good, Mum said, twirling spaghetti on her fork. And if there's any kind of emergency, like if you're to get sick to stay alone, uh, too sick to stay alone, call me at third floor nurse's station. I will, Mum. Thanks. Once his mum left for work, Colton changed into black cargo pants pants which were perfect since they were dark coloured but he could also hold all his tools. The only problem was the tools were so heavy once they were in his pockets his pants immediately fell down. This he decided was probably not the best way to avoid calling attention to himself. He grabbed a belt from his closet and secured it tightly around his waist. He tucked his phone into his back right pocket and put the ten dollar bill Uncle Mike had slipped him for helping in one of his many other pockets. He felt afraid but also excited, like when he was about to go on a roller coaster. One thought that especially gave him pleasure was the idea of getting tons and tons of tickets while Aiden and his annoying little friends got none. Aiden's disappointment would only add to Colton's joy. Why did the kid have to be so happy all the time? Even when Aiden was a baby he had been all smileys. Babies were supposed to cry, crying was normal. It would be great to see his stupid cousin shed some tears for once, just like it would be great for Colton to come out a winner for once in his life. He locked the door behind him and started the walk to Freddy's. Freddy's was the usual riot of lights, sounds and scurrying squeakers. It was two hours until closing time. Just act casual, Colton told himself. The best plan, he decided, was to lie low, play games and try not to interact with the Freddy's employees. The more he could blend in, the better. He played the ball drop and the coin pusher a few times, rolled up the tickets he won into, light, into tight spools and stuffed them into his cargo pants. As the clock crawled nearer to closing, he camped in the ski ball section. For some reason, perhaps because wooden balls in the hands of toddlers was a safety hazard, the little kids tended to be kept away from the ski ball area. Instead, this section was mostly occupied by dads killing time, who Colton was sure wouldn't notice him. Playing a few rounds of skee-ball seemed like a good way to win a few more tickets while keeping a low profile. Before too long, a recorded Freddy Fazbear voice boomed over the intercom. Sorry to spoil your fun, friends, but Freddy's will be closing in 15 minutes. Come back tomorrow and play all day. Colton took a deep breath and tried to steady his nerves. It was time to swing into action. He was going to have to find a place to hide. He walked as casually as he could manage around the perimeter of the restaurant, looking for a room he could slip into unnoticed. 
The restrooms were out of the question as someone would surely come in to clean them after closing time and he certainly wasn't going to open the door marked office. Exploring further, he found another door, decorated with a poster of Freddy Fazbear and his weird-looking animal pals, but otherwise unlabeled. He glanced around to make sure no one was looking, then tried the doorknob. It turned. As quickly and smoothly as he could, he opened the door and slipped behind it. Ninja, he thought to himself. <laughs> yeah, Fortnite ninja. Um, Colton found himself in a small storage room illuminated by a single low-wattage light bulb. There was a rack of mops and brooms. Large yellow plastic buckets on wheels were lined up against the nearest wall. In front of the back wall was a tall grey metal cabinet with double doors. Could he hide inside the cabinet? Colton opened one of the doors. The cabinet was lined with shelves stocked with cleaning supplies and rolls of paper towels and toilet paper. There was no room to hide. But then Colton noticed that the cabinet was not resting against the wall, but was instead a few inches away from it. If he stood straight and held his breath, would it be possible for him to hide behind the cabinet? It was worth a shot. Colton took a deep breath, sucked in his stomach, and stood with his back flat to the wall. Inching sideways, he squeezed himself into the narrow space behind the cabinet. He had to turn his feet slightly sideways to make them fit. His grandmother was always telling him to stand up straight, Right now, he was standing straighter than he had ever stood, his spine pressed against the wall. The back of the cabinet was touching his chest, and if he hadn't sucked in his stomach, it would be touching him there too. Colton had never really been in a tight space before, so he had never really understood claustrophobia. He understood it now. Even though he knew rationally that he had plenty of access to oxygen, he still had the sensation of not being able to breathe. The space was too tight, too cramped. He remembered reading a story about a man who was trapped in a cave and slowly went mad. Even after only being in this tiny space for a couple of minutes, he understood how quickly his sanity could slip away if he had no means of escaping. But he was in control. He could leave his hiding place anytime he wanted to. He was just choosing to stay there until closing time because it was the only way for his plan to work. He could do this. And he had to admit to himself that it was an excellent hiding place. He surveyed all the dust, all the dust bunnies he was sharing the space with and stifled a sneeze. Even if they were sneeze inducing, the dust bunnies were evidence that no one had moved this cabinet or even swept behind it in a long, long time. If he could stay still and sneezeless, he was going to be fine. Colton could hear the voices of Freddy's employees outside the storage room, then the noise of a vacuum cleaner. He let his mind drift to images of himself jumping up and down in the repaired ticket pulverizer, literally buried in tickets, claiming his richly deserved prize. Daydreaming helped pass the time, helped distract from the physical discomfort of being pressed against a wall. Colton heard the door to the supply room being pushed open, then footsteps. I don't know why I've always got to be the one to clean the toilets, an irritated sounding female voice muttered. Brittany the princess thinks she's too good to clean the bathrooms. The footsteps approached the cabinet. Colton's heart pounded like a jackhammer. Colton heard both. Uh, Colton both heard and felt the Freddy's employee open, at the, open the cabinet doors. If the back wall of the cabinet hadn't been separating them, she'd be close enough to touch him. Colton held his breath. Don't let her hear you breathe, he told himself. Okay, so spray cleaner and lots of toilet paper, the worker said. Because goodness knows, her royal highness Brittany couldn't lower herself to change a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> Someone's got a grudge against Brittany. Colton heard the cabinet door shut and the worker's footsteps walking away from him. The storage room was empty again. Colton exhaled. He let his mind drift. It could have been for a couple of minutes or an hour. He was losing track of time. But then he heard the flip of a switch and the room was plunged into darkness. A flashlight. Why had he not brought a flashlight? What if the entire restaurant was pitch black? How could he work on the ticket pulverizer then? Stupid, he chided himself. How could you be so stupid? Soon the noises of human movement outside the storage room faded, and Freddy's fell silent. Colton slowly slid from behind the storage cabinet. His back hurt, and his shoulders were stiff. It was a relief to stretch. The supply room was so dark, he had to use the light from his phone to find his way to the door. He hoped that when he opened it, 
he wouldn't be greeted by more darkness. The fluorescent lights in the game area had been turned off, but security lights on the ceiling, along with the colourful lights from the various token sucking games, still illuminated the arcade. The glow of the games in the dim room had an effect that was somewhat eerie, but at least Colton could see. He could do what he came here to do. Colton made his way to the ticket pulverizer. He unloaded his tools from the pockets and laid them out on the floor. He couldn't help but smile to himself. His plan had worked. He was in. He felt like an action hero. He had thought a lot about the mechanics of the ticket pulverizer and why it worked unfairly well for the little annoying brats. He figured out the platform was too, clo uh, too loose, too easy for them to push down. If he could tighten it up, make it more resistant, then the little brats couldn't make it budge and there would be more tickets for the older, bigger and more deserving. Colton fed four tokens into the ticket pulverizer to make the door open. Once he was inside, it didn't take him long to figure out where to tighten the platform. A few turns of the screwdriver on each corner, and the platform was much more rigid and required a lot more weight to move it. He was sorely tempted to, or sorely, sorely tempted, to feed in some more tokens and jump for tickets right then and there. But the jumping was noisy and he didn't want to do anything that might call attention to himself. He gave the platform a smell. Uh, smell? He gave the platform a small experimental push and whispered, Mission accomplished, before exiting the booth. But as he stood in the middle of the empty arcade, the reality of his situation dawned on him. His mission wasn't totally accomplished. He still needed to get out of Freddy's. He had spent so much time planning out how to get into Freddy's and work on the pulverizer that he had forgotten to plan how to get out. He had no exit strategy. Colton looked around at the doors marked exit. He was sure each of them was equipped with a security alarm. He scanned the room frantically. Maybe there was a back door he could use, maybe in the kitchen. He walked through a dim hallway and pushed open the door to the kitchen. It was pitch black, so he held up his phone to light his way past the huge ovens and cooktops. Around the corner, he saw a door and felt a rush of relief. But when he looked up, he saw the security alarm. Colton's breath was short and ragged. He couldn't just stay here until Freddy's opened up again at 11 o'clock the next morning and say, Oops, guys, I guess I got locked in. Plus, if his mom got home from work in the morning and he wasn't there, she would panic. Think, Colton told himself, there has to be a way out. Colton thought back over all his visits to Freddy's. He had been coming to Freddy's since he was a loathsome little squeaker himself, so he knew the place well. He thought about the layout of the building. Finally, an image popped into his head. The restroom. Wasn't there a window in the men's restroom? The restroom was as dark as the kitchen. Colton held up his phone for enough light to make out the shapes of the sinks and stools, and yes, the window! It was a small window, too high up to access easily, but he could get to it if he stood on one of the chairs from the dining area. He'd have to leave the chair behind in the bathroom, which wasn't ideal, but it was better than spending the whole night at Freddy's. He went back to the dining area, retrieved a chair, and carried it to the restroom. He set it under the window and climbed onto it. He was worried that the window wouldn't open, but it pushed up easily and no alarm sounded. Grunting with effort, he pulled himself through the opening and plummeted to the ground landing on his hands and knees with an oof, <laughs> oof, oof. <laughs> Some of Uncle Mike's tools fell from his pockets. He was a little shaken, but he was okay. Now all he had to do was gather up the tools and walk home like everything was normal. When his mom got home from her Saturday night shift, she'd find him in bed like nothing had happened. And tomorrow afternoon, he'd go back to Freddy's where he'd be the king of the ticket pulverizer. Colton had only $5 to take with him to Freddy's, but he figured that would be enough. $5 equaled 5 turns inside the ticket pulverizer, and by that time, he'd be rolling in tickets. Once he got there, he didn't bother with the ball drop or the coin pusher. He made a beeline to the ticket pulverizer just in time to see a group of three little kids go inside, shrieking and giggling. He smiled to himself. This should be entertaining. Stupid squeakers don't suspect a thing. He watched the little kids gleefully jump up and down. Tickets poured down like water flowing from a faucet. How could that be? After the way he'd fixed it, their weight shouldn't have been enough to trigger such an outpouring of tickets. 
Colton seethed with rage. Maybe, though, he'd at least fix things so he would get a lot of the tickets, too. Maybe he had just turned the pulverizer into a machine that heaped tickets on anyone who went inside. As long as he got his fair share, he guessed that was okay. The little kids came out holding fat ribbons of tickets in their equally fat little fists. Colton elbowed his way past them. It was his turn. I'm assuming that he's going to get nothing. <laughs> I'm assuming that's how this story is going. He put four tokens into the slot and stepped into the ticket pulverizer. His heart was beating fast in anticipation. He knew this was it. This time he was going to get what he deserved. The lights in the sign reading jump for tickets started flashing. Colton jumped. In his mind, he was a jackrabbit, a kangaroo, any animal he could think of with strong legs and big feet and mighty jumping power. He jumped and jumped, but only a trickle of tickets fell. I told you, I told you. <laughs> how, could he, how could that be after all the planning, all the hard work that went into this heist? It didn't make sense. The madder he got, the harder he jumped. Only a few tickets drifted listlessly onto the floor. When time was up, he was so furious that he stomped out of the machine and left the tickets where they were. There weren't enough of them to do him any good anyway. On the walk home, his anger turned into dejection. Why did life have to be so unfair? Why did some people have so much while people like Colton and his mum had so little? It was just luck, wasn't it? Some people had good luck, some people had bad luck. It was pretty obvious what kind of luck he had. But couldn't luck change? Surely there had to be some way to game the system. Back at the apartment, Colton's mum was humming to herself while she chopped onions. Tears were in her eyes from the smell, but she had the day off and seemed to be in a good mood. Colton sank into a kitchen chair. Hey, his mum said. I'm making sloppy joes. Have you ever thought about what a weird name that is for a sandwich? Like, was there actually a guy named Joe who looked really messy all the time? And then one day somebody said, hey Joe, we're naming a sandwich after you. And he was like, wow, that's great. But then it turned out they were calling them Sloppy Joes. And he was like, oh, wait, you're calling them what? Colton usually laughed at his mum's weird flights of fancy. But today he couldn't find the energy to respond. What's the matter, Colt? Not even a smile? His mum tapped him with a spatula. You usually think my tangents are funny. Corey shrugged. Corey? What? Who the hell is Corey? <laughs> Who is Corey? <laughs> oh no. Did, is that a misprint? That must be a misprint, right? Oh, damn it. Corey shrugged. Colt shrugged. Just not in a smiling mood, I guess. His mum sat down at the table across from him. Any particular reason you want to talk about? Not really. Just tired of seeing other people get what I deserve. People who don't deserve it, like little kids. They've not been around long enough to deserve anything. They've not paid their dues yet. They might as well still be in diapers. The more he thought about it, the angrier he felt. Rough time at Freddy's today, huh? His mum asked. Yeah, the stupid ticket pulverizer again, he said. He'd complained about it enough that his mum understood what he was talking about it. No luck with it? Colton shook his head. I'm never going to get enough tickets to get what I want. Well, I've been thinking about it, and you know, there are other ways of getting what you want, Mum said, pulling her hair back with the rubber band she kept around her wrist. Colton didn't think he liked his mum's tone. It was the same tone she used when she was about to nag him to do his homework or chores. What do you mean? Well, his mum said, I had a part-time job when I was your age. I worked at the Swirly Cone after school and on weekends making cones and shakes and Sundays. It didn't pay much, but the money adds up when you don't have any other expenses. Colton couldn't help but feel offended. Are you telling me I have to get a job? I already help Uncle Mike out two days a week. I'm not telling you that you have to. I'm just saying it's an option. If you worked, say, 10 to 15 hours a week, you could save up money to buy those luxury items I can't afford. If you keep throwing money at the ticket pulverizer, you'll have eventually spent more money trying to win tickets than that video game console costs anyway. Colton stood up from his chair. He was outraged. I can't believe you're making me get a job. I'm just a kid. Haven't you ever heard of child labor laws? <laughs> For goodness sake. His mum rolled her eyes. You are legally old enough to have a part-time job. 
Kids younger than you make money mowing lawns or doing odd jobs for people. There's no reason you couldn't do something like that. Or you could see if Mike would give you a few hours a week at minimum wage. It feels good to earn your own money, Colton. It's just something to think about. What's the point of having a cool video game console if you don't have time to play it because you're working all the time? Colton felt his voice getting louder. What a zoomer. If dad was still here, we wouldn't have to worry about money. For a moment, his mum looked hurt, almost as if he had struck her. But then her expression shifted to irritation. No, we wouldn't. But he isn't here, so we have to do all the best we can. She got up from the table and went back to the stove. Dinner will be ready in 20 minutes. Between now and then, why don't you see if you can get over your bad mood? Colton didn't get over his bad mood. He lay in bed playing the same scene over and over in his head. Those repulsive little kids laughing and cheering as an avalanche of tickets fell on them. He didn't understand why his attempt to fix the ticket pulverizer had failed. There had to be another way to do it. He got out of bed. He went to his desk and started making sketches of the machine. Screwing the platform in tighter hadn't been enough. He should have known it wasn't going to be that easy. To solve this problem, he was going to have to dig deeper. Colton had become obsessed with the ticket pulverizer. He looked up similar kinds of machines online trying to get a better understanding of their mechanics. Today, in shop class, he sat furiously sketching and making notes, as he had done in class every day for the past week. Mr. Harrison, the fatherly, balding shop teacher, leaned over his shoulder. Colton, you've been drawing and making notes for ages. What is it you're designing? Colton knew he wouldn't tell Mr. Harrison what he was really doing. He knew no adults would understand his obsession. Colton wasn't even sure he understood it himself, but he knew he couldn't stop until he finally experienced justice from the ticket pulverizer. It's more of a plan for fixing something, Colton said, still furiously sketching. Mr. Harrison raised an eyebrow. I can appreciate that, but you know that if you don't actually make something, I can't give you a grade, right? Right, Colton said, not looking up from his notebook. He was relieved when Mr. Harrison walked away to talk to other students. He didn't care if he got his grade or not. Right now, anything that didn't pertain to the ticket pulverizer felt like an unneeded interruption. That night, Colton brought his notebook with him to the dinner table. He sketched and wrote notes between bites of meatloaf and mashed potatoes and peas, which, due to his distraction, he didn't even really taste. I have Sunday off this weekend for the first time in ages, his mum said. I thought we might do something fun together. Maybe pack a picnic and drive up to the mountains, go on a little hike. We could stop on the way home for ice cream at that place you like. Mm-hmm, Colton said absently. He was aware that his mum was talking, but he hadn't actually processed any of her words. Colton, mum said. You're a million miles away and you have been for over a week now. What is it that you're working on day and night? She gestured at his notebook. It's, a, it's just a project for school, Colton mumbled, not looking up. Well, I hope it is, Mum said, pushing away her plate of half-eaten food. Because I ran into your English teacher yesterday and she says she's worried about you. She says that you've not been turning in your assignments and your grade has slipped to a low D. And D means danger, according to her. Is there a reason you're falling behind in your work? Colton finally looked up. If he didn't get his mum off his back, he wasn't going to be able to make his plan work. I'll talk to her tomorrow about what I need to do to catch up in class. His mum nodded. Okay, I know you don't like to talk about emotional stuff, but is there anything you need to say to me? Anything that's bothering you? She looked sad, as if she might cry, which Colton desperately hoped she wouldn't. I know since I work a lot of nights, it may feel like I'm not here when you need me, and I'm sorry for that. But where it counts, I am always here for you, Colton. She covered his hand with her own. Just don't shut me out, okay? Okay, Mom. Sheesh! <laughs> oh, sorry, I had to do it. <laughs> okay, Mom. Sheesh! Um, Colton drew his... <laughs> oh, sorry. <clears throat> Let me calm down. That shouldn't have been as funny as it was. Colton drew his hand away. 
He was more than ready for his conversation to end. So, there's nothing you want to talk about? Nope. He went back to his sketching. Mom sighed and got up from her chair. Okay, I guess I'd better get ready for work. Will you load the dishwasher for me? Uh huh, Colton said, forgetting the promise as soon as he had made it. Once his mum was gone, he left for Freddy's. He only had two bucks in his pocket, which wouldn't go very far in the arcade. But he wasn't there to play games. He was there to observe the ticket pulverizer. Colton stood a few steps away from the machine that consumed his every waking hour. He looked at it as an enemy to be defeated, like in one of those Greek myths he had read in middle school. He was the hero, and it was the monster. And the clown, the horrible gape-jawed clown, was like a dragon standing guard that he had to defeat before his big battle with the boss monster. He watched as group after group of loathsome little kids trooped into the machine and jumped up and down and stamped their tiny little feet while the tickets poured out. Not like a faucet, but like a waterfall. It was so unfair, it sickened him. A little girl with a blonde ponytail who was maybe 8 or 9 years old came marching up to him. Hey, why do you keep staring at the people inside the ticket pulverizer? She said. She pronounced the word pulverizer carefully, like she was sounding it out. Oh, that's really cute. Pulverizer. <laughs> Colton was incensed. How dare this little brat approach him and talk to him in such a judgmental way? Where were her parents? I'm not watching the people. I'm watching the machine, he said in a cold, measured tone. Well, my friend over there says you're creepy. The little girl said. Colton looked over at a dark-haired girl who was standing by the ticket pulverizer and staring at them as they talked. Her eyes were big and unblinking and her gaze was penetrating. Tell your friend the feeling is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good response. Oh, clap and a half. Um, the little girl crinkled her nose. I don't even know what that means. If you don't know what it means, Colton said deepening his voice in hopes of sounding adult and intimidating, then maybe that means you're not old enough to be starting conversations with somebody older than you. He made a shooting gesture as if he were a pesky, sna a pesky gnat. Go away. I'm happy to go away from you, the little girl said, turning her back on him and flouncing back to her friend. Good, then go, Colton muttered. The little girl was annoying, but she had told him something he needed to know. By scoping out the ticket pulverizer, he was calling unwanted attention to himself. If he was going to pull this off, he had to go unnoticed. He couldn't have horrible little girls noticing him and thinking he was creepy, and he certainly couldn't do anything to attract the attention of the Freddy staff. He needed to be invisible, silent and stealthy. Like a ninja, he reminded himself. <laughs> Colton walked away from the ticket pulverizer and toward the exit. He had seen what he had needed to see. By Friday night, Colton's plan was complete. This time he wouldn't do his work at night. He would work in daylight so he could see what he was doing. He would set his alarm for 6am and would sneak into Freddy's before it opened. He figured if he had successfully used the restroom window to sneak out, he could also use it to sneak in. Before he went to bed, he laid out his necessities, a dark shirt, his cargo pants, his phone, and the tools he would stuff in the pockets. And this time, even though it was day, uh, he was taking a flashlight. If he was going to go deep inside the dark innards of the ticket pulverizer, he needed to be able to see what he was doing. Colton laid in bed, wide awake, running through the heist over and over in his mind. The one thing that was worrying him was the bathroom window. He had used a chair for the boost he needed to get out of it, but how was he going to get into it? He couldn't exactly take a step without it with him and prop it against the building without practically announcing, don't mind me folks, I'm just doing some breaking and entering here. He would just have to improvise. He'd get through the window somehow. Finally, excitement gave way to exhaustion and Colton fell asleep. In his dreams, he jumped up and down on the pulverizer's um, platform and tickets cascaded over him until they were waist high and shoulder high in them. He was literally swimming in tickets. People watching him cheered. He had never felt so much joy. When the alarm went off, his eyes flew open. This was it. Today was the day he was going to make it work. He took off his pyjamas and put on a dark shirt and cargo pants. He loaded the tools in his pockets and tightened his belt as an added precaution. He stopped in the kitchen and wolfed down a banana and chugged a glass of orange juice. He was ready. 
The streets were largely deserted at 6.30am, which was another reason Colton congratulated himself on the brilliance of his plan. No witnesses. Once he finished, finished? Once he reached the Freddy's building, he walked around the side and found the bathroom window. If he stood on tiptoe, he could just reach the windowsill with his fingertips. He groaned in disappointment. There was no way he had the upper body strength to pull himself up. He was going to have to find something to climb on. He walked further around the building. Next to the back door was a lidded garbage can on wheels. Perfect, Colton thought. The handle of the garbage can was sticky with something Colton didn't want to think about, but he hung onto it anyway and rolled the can onto the side of the building. The wheels made a little more noise than he would have liked, but there didn't seem to be anyone around to hear it. The position, or sorry, he positioned the garbage can right under the window and awkwardly climbed on top of it. The can's plastic lid warped under his weight and the wheels made him feel unsteady. But he pushed up the window, grabbed the, sti grabbed the sill and started dragging himself through, head first. Soon he was awkwardly hanging with his hands in the sink and his feet still sick sticking out the window. Not sure what else to do, he pushed his feet off the windowsill and flipped forward, hitting the floor hard on his backside. It didn't tickle and the wind was knocked out of him, but he wasn't injured. And most important, he was in. He pulled himself clumsily to his feet and waited for a minute for his breathing to return to normal. How was it that in the movies people could jump from a great height, land hard and then hop right up and keep on running? Because it's a movie. <laughs> when Colton swung open the bathroom door, the clown animatronic was standing in the hallway, almost as if it had been waiting for him. Colton jumped backward, uh, his heart beating fast. Yeesh, <laughs> he said, looking at the thing's horrible, gape-mouthed grin. Shouldn't somebody put you away at night? He squeezed past the clown, fearful that it might grab him. But it just stood there like the inanimate object it was. Still, when Colton walked down the hallway, it was hard not to look back to see if the clown was following him. Colton didn't think he'd ever get used to this silent version of Freddy's. No screaming rugrats, no bleeping games, no pre-recorded songs and chatter from Freddy's animatronic band. It was quieter than the library. Then Colton heard a faint jingling. Or at least he thought he did. It was the soft, tingly noise that the bells on the birthday clown's costume would make. Was the clown following him? Colton had to laugh at himself. Of course the clown wasn't following him. It was a machine, a thing. It was no more capable of stalking somebody than a vacuum cleaner. He heard the jingling again, closer this time. He ducked behind Bibi's bull drop and listened for the bells. He heard nothing. When he stepped out from behind the machine, he saw the clown. It was at the end of the row of games with the back turned to him. Colton hurried as quietly as he could in the opposite direction. Jingle, jingle. The clown was on the move again. Colton squatted down beside Dee Dee's fishing game. His heart was pounding in his chest. He held his breath as the clown shambled past him, bells tinkling. It's not looking good for you, Colton told himself. Stop acting like a stupid squeaker. You can't get all spooked by a dumb fake clown and lose the opportunity that's right there for the taking. You know why you came here. He made his way to the ticket pulverizer. When he got there, the clown was standing in front of the machine as if it were guarding it. But when Colton waved his hands in front of the clown's eyes, it didn't react at all. One eye looked ahead and one looked down and off to the right, like always. And of course, they weren't really looking anyway, Colton told himself. The clown's eyes were as unseeing as the button eyes on Colton's childhood teddy bear. He couldn't let the creepy clown distract him from his mission. Colton stared at the ticket pulverizer, its lights flashed and glowed. It felt like an enemy issuing a challenge. But soon, Colton thought, he would tame the ticket pulverizer, and it would be a faithful friend, giving him the rewards he so richly deserved. He walked around the machine, surveying its base. On one side, he spotted what looked like the larger version of a battery compartment cover on the TV remote control. If he could get that cover open, he might be able to squeeze into the base of the machine to tinker with its workings. Colton dug through his pockets to find the tools he needed. He set out his phone, a screwdriver, and a flashlight. Colton felt a hand on his shoulder, but it wasn't a normal human hand. He looked down to see a large three-fingered white glove connected to telltale yellow coils. Get off me, he yelled. 
He slapped the hand away, then whirled around and shoved the clown as hard as he could in its, mis in its midsection. It hurtled backward, crashed into an arcade cabinet and fell onto its side. Colton was amazed how lightweight the clown was and how far he had been able to push it. Seeing it lying there on the floor, it looked like a broken toy, certainly not anything to be scared of. He got down on his knees and pulled on the cover. It flipped open easily. Clearly, it was a hatch that allowed access to the pulverizer's innards. The opening was small, no bigger than the bathroom window Colton had used to break into Freddy's. Colton dropped his screwdriver inside the door, and then, turning on its flashlight, he crawled into the machine. The space inside was cramped. There was no room to sit up. He could only lie down with his legs bent sideways in an uncomfortable position, with the bottom of the machine's platform touching the length of his body. Shining his flashlight around, he was relieved to see that the mechanical parts looked how he expected them to look. It was just going to be hard for him to do the work he needed to do from an awkward reclining position. Colton squinted at the inner workings of the ticket pulverizer. As he started to loosen a screw, he felt something tightly grip his ankles. He shined his flashlight to see a pair of white gloved hands, one grasping each ankle. The yellow coil arms were stretched out long but they contracted as they pulled his body toward the opening where he had entered the compartment. How could the clown weigh so little and yet be so strong? It had pulled his legs straight and was dragging him out of the machine. Once Colton's legs were outside, he wrenched uh, his right one free and threw a bunch of wild hard kicks that he felt connect with the clown's body. After one particularly forceful kick, the clown loosened its grip on its other leg, and Colton scrambled to get his full body back into the base of the pulverizer. Once he was inside, he closed the hatch he had entered through behind him. The clown's hands were huge, awkward things, and he hoped it would lack the no motor skills needed. Wait, what? The clown's ha hands were large, awkward things, and he hoped it would lack the motor skills needed to pull the hatch back open. Besides, from the strength of his kicks, maybe he put the clown out of commission anyway. Now it was time for Colton to steady his hands and his nerves and do what he came here to do. Even with the flashlight, it took a few minutes for his eyes to adjust to the darkness. It was like being in a small, tight alcove in a cave. Memories of the claustrophobic closet in the back room of Freddy's momentarily rushed back to him. But when he shined his flashlight on the machinery, he smiled. He knew what he needed to do. It was going to be challenging because he needed both hands to do his work. But there was no place to set the flashlight, which he needed so he could see. Finally, he awkwardly secured the flashlight under his left armpit and angled the beam to hit the area he needed to work on. All his reading, planning and obsessing had paid off. Even though he was working under less than ideal conditions, the process of fixing the pulverizer couldn't have gone more smoothly. At some point, he'd realised the trick. Flip these switches to tie the ticket release to the size of the bounces. Loosen these screws to give the platform even more bounce. The little kids would get more tickets, sure, but big kids like Colton would be flush with them. Colton smiled at his achievement. People didn't give him the credit he deserved, he thought. His teachers didn't comprehend who they were dealing with. They thought he was just some regular high school freshman, a C student, average, no different from a thousand other kids. His mom, even though she loved him, didn't give him enough credit either. Only Colton could see the truth about himself. He was brilliant, a mechanical genius. With his newly re realised self-confidence, his luck was sure to change. The thousands of tickets he was going to win from the ticket pulverizer were only the beginning. Colton smiled at his handiwork one last time, then reached over his head to push the small door open so he could climb out and make his exit. The door wouldn't budge. There has to be some kind of mistake, Colton thought. He pushed the door again, harder this time. It still refused to move. It was like it was locked from the outside. But how is that possible? No one was in Freddy's, and even if they were, why would they suspect someone was inside the ticket pulverizer? He shoved it again. It held fast. Colton shined his flashlight around the tiny space, trying to see if there might be another way to get out, a panel that could be removed or something. There was nothing. Colton's flashlight found a small round hole about the size of the head of a bolt. It was just big enough to peek through. Colton closed one eye and looked through the tiny opening with the other. All he could see were big green shoes. Clown shoes. 
It was standing guard there, waiting. If it couldn't get him out of the machine itself, it would wait until he found a way to get out on his own. He thought of an expression his uncle used sometimes, between a rock and a hard place. He had never really understood the meaning of that saying until now. He felt himself starting to shake. His heart thudded in his chest so loud that he could hear it. Somehow he felt sweaty and cold at the same time. The space seemed to shrink around him until it was squeezing him from all sides. He lay with his knees hugged to his chest, trying to make himself smaller so the space would seem larger. It'll be okay, he told himself. In two or three hours, Freddy's would open and somebody would rescue him. But how could he stand to stay in this tiny space, in this uncomfortable position for two or three hours? Was there even enough air to keep him alive that long? Already the air he was breathing felt scarce and stale. And assuming someone did rescue him, how would he explain himself? I was playing jump for tickets last night and I guess I jumped so hard I fell in. Oops. He was going to have to come up with um, a more credible story. Colton looked down at his flashlight. He had no idea how much life the batteries still had in them. It was probably best to try to conserve them. He switched off the flashlight and was plunged into total darkness. He remembered a story he'd read in school about a man trapped in the deep blackness of a coal mine, waiting to die. He felt like that man. He tried to let his, hand, his mind wander. He made lists of things, favourite video games, favourite movies, favourite foods. But the last one was a bad idea because it made him realise how hungry he was. He usually ate a full breakfast, but today he'd have nothing but that banana. He was thirsty too. It never occurred to him to bring water because he hadn't thought that he might be trapped like this. Colton's stomach lurched, not with hunger but with nausea. The acid from the orange juice he had drunk earlier seemed to be upsetting his stomach, but he knew it wasn't really the orange juice that was affecting him. It was fear. Fear was eating away at his insides and making him sick. Don't throw up, don't throw up, Colton told himself. If he threw up in here, he would be trapped in this tiny space with the horrible smell of his own vomit. He sucked in great gulps of air, trying to quell his nausea. But then, he worried. What, was, what, what if he was being too greedy with the air? What if he was using the limited supply of oxygen in this tiny space too quickly? <laughs> Both of Colton's legs had fallen asleep, but there was no room to move them around to wake them up. He wiggled his toes and moved his feet at his ankles, all the time feeling like he was being prickled by hundreds of ne needles. His neck was starting to cramp and he pivoted his head from side to side trying to relieve the pain. But the pain and sickness weren't the worst parts. The worst part was the question gnawing back at the, at the back of Colton's mind. What if no one finds me? What if nobody hears me and I die from thirst or hunger? Will somebody find me when my body starts to rot? Or will all that's left of me be a dusty, forgotten skeleton curled up in this compartment for years and years like a mummy in its tomb? But he also knew that curling up and dying inside the machine might not be the worst thing that could happen to him. From outside the machine, he heard jingling as the clown patrolled back and forth in front of the ticket pulverizer. He thought again of the mice who wanted to hang the bell on the cat so they knew uh, so that they would know when their killer was close. Colson shrugged. Maybe it was better not to know. Clearly sitting here in the dark, this like this was making him a little crazy. He turned on the flashlight for a couple of seconds as a reality check. At least he knew he could still see. Good. But when he turned off the light and was surrounded by darkness again, he felt scared of, uh, he felt scared of the dark, as though he was a little kid. It was like this terrible experience was making him... Uh, sorry, was making him... Uh... Move backward in time, becoming the child he had once been. The child that he hated, like he hated all children. But wait, Colton remembered something. His phone. He had his phone. If all else failed, he could call his mom, confess to his crimes and get rescued. She was probably already home from a shift and wondering where he was. He reached into his back right pocket. It was empty. He tried the left back one, even though he knew he hadn't put it there. He patted down all his pockets frantically, and then a picture flashed in his mind him setting out the phone and his tools on the floor beside the machine, opening the machine's door and dropping into the tools. Uh, and dropping the tools inside, but not the phone. Colton said some words his mother didn't allow him to say. Then, as if on cue, he heard it. A faint ringing coming from just outside the machine. Oh my god! His ringtone. 
he was sure it was his mum calling to see if he was okay. You guys don't know this, obviously, but this, this is one of my worst nightmares. Getting a call f on your phone, but not being able to access your phone and being in danger, if you know what I mean. Like, being able to hear, like, being able to hear your only source of hope, but not being able to, to like, respond to it, is like my worst nightmare. That's terrifying to me. Oh my god. Okay. Um, <laughs> Colton was not okay. He pushed on the door with his full strength. It was like trying to move a solid brick wall. He pushed on the platform just above him. It was useless. Colton peeped through the tiny hole in the ticket pulverizer's base. He saw his phone on the black and white tile floor, vibrating as it rang. And then a white-gloved, three-fingered hand reached down and picked it up. No, he screamed. No, 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 he screamed till his throat was raw, knowing the whole time that it wouldn't make any difference. Time passed. How much? An hour. Five minutes. Colton had no idea. In the dark, with nothing to do and nothing to see, time lost its meaning. Other things started to lose their meaning too. Colton started to find it hard to form words in his mind. He knew the physical sensations he was feeling, thirst, hunger, pain from his body being cramped into an unnatural position, the uncomfortable pressure of a full bladder. But he couldn't find the words for any of these things. He could only feel them and whimper softly and wait. He wasn't even sure anymore what he was waiting for. Scared, unable to use language or feed himself, in very real danger of wetting his pants, Colton was regressing to the helplessness of an infant. If he continued to go backward physically and emotionally, the next logical step would be to, uh, to disappear into nothingness, to become one with the darkness. For a while it seemed as if it had happened, that Colton had simply ceased to exist. But then he heard it, and if he could hear, it must mean that he existed. It was the music, the bleeping and blipping of the games, the annoying voices of the animatronic characters. Colton remi uh, remembered where he was and what his predicament was. But things were looking up. Noises meant people. If Freddy's was open for business, somebody was there to hear him. He started out by yelling for help, but quickly realised that his throat was too dry and his voice was too weak from disuse to make much noise. Instead, he banged on the platform with his fists. He hit the stupid thing over and over, but with no results. His knuckles ached and he and would probably bruise. He figured no one was nearby and decided to conserve his energy. If he kept banging on the platform continuously, he would only exhaust himself. He would wait a little while until there uh, he would wait a little while until there were some customers, then try again. Like a cat washing its paws. Colton licked his knuckles, trying to soothe his pain with the moisture of his saliva but his tongue was too dry from thirst to be of much use. At least now, the terrible darkness was no longer accompanied by silence. If he could hear noises, he knew he was alive. From the sound of little footsteps and high-pitched yelling and giggling, it was clear that Freddy's had now opened for business, and when Freddy's was full of overstimulated rug rats, it was the noisiest place on earth. It was amazing how much Colton could hear from his tiny prison. He could pick out the sounds of different video games. He recognised sound effects that accompanied BB's ball drop and the annoying jingly tune that played when somebody put in a token to play Dee Dee's fishing hole. He could hear the canned music of Freddy Fazbear's band as they launched into the birthday song. He could hear some obnoxious child whining, But why isn't it my happy birthday? <laughs> this was great. If people were in the pulverizer, even if they were stupid little kids, Colton could get them to notice them. They could tell an adult that they heard screaming under the platform and he would be saved. Colton breathed a sigh of relief. This ordeal would be over soon. He could feel them above him, jostling around and bumping into one another. The platform pressed down on him a little more from their weight. They were giggling and talking on one another in little kid gibberish. Colton suddenly became aware of how urgent his situation was. If the platform was already pressing down on him, more from the little kids just standing there, he had to get their attention before they started jumping. His repair to the machine would make the platform dip even lower into his crawl space. Colton banged on the bottom of the platform. Hey, he yelled as loudly as he could. Oh no.
I know, I know, I know how this is going to end. All the children are going to jump up and down on the platform and he's going to get squashed. <laughs> it's going to be a brutal death. Oh my god. It's going to be something like that. Hey, as he yelled, as he, sh he, oh my gosh, sorry. He yelled as loudly as he could with his dry, scratchy throat. Hey, I'm down here. Help me, help. He was going to have to try harder if he was going to make himself heard over all the noises of the place, plus the noisiness of the kids themselves. He pounded on the bottom of the platform with his hammer. Help, he screamed. I'm trapped in here. Help, help. Prepare for the ticket pulverizer countdown. Now when I finish counting, everybody jump up and down as hard as you can. All together. The clown's pre-recorded voice said. The children's screams of excitement drowned out Colton's screams for help. Here we go, the clown announced. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Now jump for tickets! Overhead, Bella the birthday girl and her six friends jumped in unison. The sound like a stampede of a wild buffalo. The platform dropped, they laughed and cheered, and the tickets fell in like rain. But then something wasn't right. Bella had jumped in the ticket pulverizer lots of times. This time felt different. The platform wasn't dropping as low as usual. The flow of tickets had slowed to a trickle. It's slowing down, she yelled to her friend Aiden. <gasps> Jump harder, Aiden yelled back. <laughs> yes, Aiden. <laughs> Bella jumped higher and landed with more force. The platform dropped. Some tickets sprinkled down, but it was a light shower, not the flood of tickets Bella wanted for her birthday. Let's all hold hands and jump together, Bella yelled. I don't want to hold hands, Aiden yelled back. Come on, it's my birthday, Bella said. Aiden shrugged and relented, and the seven kids joined in a circle. One, two, three, jump, Bella yelled. The kids leaped, then landed at the same time, forcing the platform down, then up, then down further. Jump! The platform dropped an inch. Jump! And another inch. Jump! And another. Bella and her friends laughed and let go of each other so they could grab the falling tickets. After the next jump though, the platform didn't go any lower. The kids jumped again, but it stayed put. Bella looked out at her dad who was outside the ticket pulverizer cheering them on. It's not working, she yelled. Jump harder, sweetie, her dad called back. Oh my god. Jump, jump, jump. The kids all jumped with as much force as they possibly could. The platform lowered a tiny bit more, less than an inch, then wobbled a little, then stopped. One lonely ticket fell from the machine's ceiling. Outside the ticket pulverizer, Bella's dad nudged his wife. That game's broken, he said. The platform's not dropping like it should. I think I'm going to go get a manager. He was already looking round, trying to spot who was in charge. Good idea, Bella's mum said. Looking inside the ticket pulverizer, she could see that even though the children were still jumping away, they were getting increasingly frustrated. The platform was pretty much stationary. In a few minutes, Bella's dad returned with a heavy-set Freddy's employee whose name, tag read Ted. He gave the machine a once-over. You're right, he said. The thing's busted some way. He squatted, reached down under the machine, and turned it off. The children looked shocked by the sudden absence of light and noise. I'm sorry, kids, Ted said, yelling over the general chaos of Freddy's. The ticket pulverizer isn't working right. I need you guys to get out of the machine, but I'll tell you what. Since you didn't get to win much in there, if you all go up to the front counter, the cashier will give you 20 free tickets each. The kids' moods got sunnier as they exited the machine and ran in the direction of the free tickets. The clown animatronic was acting weird too. It was pointing at the base of the machine and grabbing at Ted's arm, as if it didn't want him to go inside the ticket pulverizer. But, of course, it didn't want anything. It was a stupid robot, a stupid robot that seemed to be malfunctioning. Ted shook his head. Was every cheap piece of equipment in this run-down place breaking all at the same time? Ted climbed into the pulverizer and jumped on the platform a few times. It hardly moved, even with the force of all his sample, or of all his ample weight. Though he did think he heard a liquidy squishing sound that, of course, made no sense. 
he was going to have to call the repair guy. When Ted exited the machine, the clown robot was standing in front of the door. Its face, which was usually wearing a comically huge grin, was now a mask of tragedy, with a downturned mouth and sad-looking eyes. Was a, te was a tear sliding down its cheek? Or was Ted imagining things? Sometimes he thought he should find a more normal place to work. <laughs> Tell me about it. One of the little kids from the ticket pulverizer must have noticed the clown's sad face too because he ran up to it and said, Hey Coils, remember me? I'm your buddy Aiden. Don't be sad, okay? It's, it's bad to be sad. My cousin Colton's sad all the time. That's why I'm saving up my tickets to buy him a present. Oh my god. Oh my god. This, oh my god, wow. The little boy threw his arms around the clown animatronic and it hugged him back, holding him in its springy, coiled yellow arms. Weird, Ted thought, walking past the scene on the way to his office. The ticket pulverizer stood empty, or at least empty as far as anyone could see. Ted returned from his office with a sign that he hung on the machine's door. Out of order. Ah! <laughs> what? Oh my god. Okay. Okay, that was good. That was very... That was... That was an insane ending. Oh my god. Okay. If you guys saw my video the other day about my predictions for, for this book. Um, I was like... Oh yeah, there's going to be an arcade game where they jump and then they get tickets. And I don't know what the real threat is going to be. Because, like, what's what's a threat in a game when you have to jump, you know? Um, but that is, like, per like that's top-notch story-making there. Where, um, of course, the platform goes down. And if you have someone under there, they're going to get squished, essentially. That's so, oh my god, that's creepy. That's so creepy. And I love how it changes perspective at the end. And I love the reveal that Aiden was saving up his tickets to buy a present for Colton. That just makes it so much worse. Oh my god. Wow. That was very cool. Um... Yeah, I don't have many theories for this, apart from the fact that um, the clown is probably infested with agony. Uh, I, I assume I assume the clown is infested with agony. That was a creepy clown. Like, he didn't need to do much. He literally just followed Colton and trapped him in uh, uh, underneath the machine, and that was it. That was it. Um, yeah, that, that story was very effective for me. I really enjoyed it. It's definitely at least an A tier for me, I think. Uh, I really like the creepy stories with weird and uh, wacky endings. Creepy endings. Anyway, that's it. That's it for um, Jump for Tickets, the next one. And the last one in this book is Pizza Kit, uh, which I've heard is also amazing. So, um, yeah, tell me, guys, if you're excited for that. And I'll see you later. Goodbye.